Okay, let's start. Um, this is my favorite class, if you remember that one. Maybe it is not that visible, but can I make it larger? Can I make it larger? Yeah, I think I can. Yeah, so this is just an empty class, and it doesn't, it, does, it just contains a string in it. Well, it doesn't matter if it's a public or private, let's make it private, okay? Uh, it, it has a string in it, and um, what does it say, this one, void G for more information? Well, do, do you see anything wrong with this one? Oh yeah, we need STD, right? Okay. So that's, that's the whole thing, okay? So I have a function that doesn't do anything. So it produces some code, doesn't matter, it's a MIPS code, you don't, you don't, you did not see the MIPS code right, right, yet, right? Well, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just, you can understand what it is. Add IU, okay, add integer, unsigned, store word, move, no program, okay, don't do anything, move, etc. So it is doing lots of movements and additions between registers. So it is basically setting up the stack, and then it is just, uh, it just giving back the whatever it allocated at the stack, and it just uh, returned back to 31, okay? So that's, that's, that's the thing. <coughs> uh, it is all empty. What I'm saying is that you don't see any code that is produced for this class A because I did not use A. But when I do this, when I do this, when I say I have an object of A, it produces code, and as you see, it produces code for this. Can I make this a little bit both large and visible? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So it it did this. Okay, it said that I am going to make a, a constructor. This is the constructor. Okay. Remember what we said? Even if the class is empty, there is a constructor, no parameter constructor copy constructor, assignment operator, and the destructor, right? So uh, it, it built a constructor for it, okay? Even though I didn't write any code. And if you look at this, the constructor calls the strings constructor in it, okay? So it is calling the strings constructor because for every object of A, there is a string in it, so it has to be constructed. So it is doing that. Also, it produced a destructor too. Okay, so this is the destructor. And destructor does some stuff and after that it calls the, okay, it does the string destructor. And what else other than the destructor? Okay, I don't, yeah, this is the, this is the, where does this go? The line seven, okay. This is line seven, yeah. See what happens with the line seven? Where is like yeah okay, it constructs the objects okay it constructs the object first, then it called the destructor, because it is out of scope right right right, okay, it is out of scope. If I do this, integer k the initial value is three. In that case, let me mark on this one. Yeah, so it is three put. Do you, do you read it? Can somebody read this one? Line 53 and 54. Even though you don't know assembly, yeah, you can read it. Put three to what? Put three to register number two, exactly. Then store register number two to the 24th position from the top of the stack. Okay, because K is a local. Then after that, after that, destroy this object, destruct this object, delete this object A. <coughs> okay? It is calling this uh, object destructor. Okay, so uh, this is kind of repeat of what we, what we did in, in, in, in last week's uh, lectures. And then let's, let's do other things. What did I say? Uh, even, uh, even for an empty class, if you don't do anything, okay? There is a, a, a default constructor, of course it has to be there. Copy constructor, assignment operator, destructor, 
Uh, well, the compiler is smart. It not produce. It did not produce any assignment operators or the copy constructors because I did not use them. But if I use it, how am I gonna do it? Okay, if I do this, if I do this, okay, constructor is here, destructor is here. Okay, where is my uh, here? It is my copy constructor. It says that I am going to take an A reference. It didn't put a const in there. Well, this is not exactly the C++ code, okay? This is just a simple name for a function in an assembly, okay? So you are not going to see const and that kind of stuff. Okay, so it produced <coughs> it produced the copy constructor. Uh, let, let's let's do this. Remember this one? If I can do it. So what did I say? This is not an assignment operator, okay? It's a copy construction thing. Let's let's try to find that line. How am I gonna go? I think it is there. Um, well, well, it's not that. Where is it? Line eight. It has to be. Yeah. So th see this one. This one corresponds to line eight. As you see, it is calling the copy constructor. And in fact, if you look at the code, constructor is here, destructor is there, and copy constructor is here. You don't see any assignment operators produced because this is not the assignment operator. This is a copy constructor call. And then let's do the assignment. Let's do the assignment. And in that case, assignment operator will be <coughs> built one for you automatically. Here it is. Okay? So, even though I did not do anything in it, it's just a simple uh, something in it. It produced the default constructor, okay, you know, parameter constructor, copy constructor, assignment operator, and the uh, uh, destructor. Okay? So, test this, do this again. Uh, uh, with your experiments using this uh, nice compiler explorer uh, website, uh, do this kind of stuff and try to see when is going to be called when. See at the end of my program, at the end of my program, okay, a destructor is called. I think this is the destructor for AIS, and another destructor is maybe. Maybe this one, okay, so this one is another destructor. Where is my assignment operator? Here is the assignment operator. It is calling assignment operator. You can read, can you, can you guess where I store my A and B? Tell me where I am storing my A and B. The one with the hood. Yeah, put that phone away. To the, no, no, not in your pocket. Yeah. What's your name? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Yes. I don't understand, sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Nice to meet you, Yes. Okay. Tell me. Where I store, yes. Well, of course it is stack, but where in the stack? Well, stack is something like this, right? Stack is something like, something like, stack is something like, let's try to open the last thing, I hope it opens. Okay, stack is something like this. Okay, you put stuff on top of it and you pop it from top of it. So uh, you store your variables at the uh, top of the stack. Your variable A is here, B is there. If I make a new stack object, okay, local object, is going to be put on top of it, right? So I always keep a pointer to the top of the stack. This is called, in this case, SP or FP. In this case, it is FP. SP is stack pointer, okay? So FP is a special register. So when you say FP, 
Uh, let's go there, okay. FP48 or 24, it means that, okay, go 24 bytes below the stack and your object is there, A. Go, sorry, what was it? 28 and what? Uh, 48 and 24, yeah. Go 20, 48, it is there, and go 24 and it is there, and etc. right? So, you, you, you uh, address your objects on the stack by specifying the local, specifying the uh, local offset from your stack pointer or FP. Okay? That's where I store my variables A and B. And after that, I just call this one. So it looks like the operator assignment is just a function name. It needs two parameters and parameters are at register number five and register number four. Okay, so of course, you, I'm not expecting to understand everything here. I'm just trying to tell you what, what the compiler thinks, okay? It is, I mean, you, you cannot understand what the human thinks because we don't know how our brain works, right? We don't know, I mean, you, you cannot know what I think. I don't know what I think. I don't know what's happening here. Neither of you know what's happening in your heads. But we know what's happening with the compiler because compiler is doing this, compiler is thinking this. So to understand, to better understand how the compiler works, the best thing is go to the assembly that it produces, it produces, and try to understand what's going on in there. Okay? This is how you how you do it. Okay? Even though you don't understand what exactly each line means, but as you know, assembly is a very simple language. So you have registers, you move registers around, you add registers. You multiply them, and nothing else, and you jump, okay? You jump, okay? There are absolute jumps, there are uh, procedure calls, and etc. Okay? So, uh, do that experiment, this kind of experiment, uh, before tomorrow's class. Okay, let's go back. Uh, by the way, if I don't do the string in here, compiler is smart. As you see, it just didn't do anything because there is nothing in class A. Assignment would not do anything, right? What are you going to assign? What is the meaning of the default assignment operator? Memorize copy, right? What is it going to copy? Nothing. So it did not produce anything. Okay? It did not produce anything. Even for this line 7, I don't see any code. Okay? Even for line 7, I don't see any code. If I put some stuff in it, then things become things become more uh, more meaningful. But if I do this, surprise, surprise, okay, it produced code for this line seven. Where is my seven? Well, it produced code for this line eight. Maybe this line ten. This is eight. This is ten. Okay. But it not produce anything for this line, and or this uh, or the destructors, or for the class. It didn't produce anything because what is the what is the what is the compiler? What does the compiler do for for for a class of this uh, this type? It has to initialize i, right? How do you initialize an uh, uh, uh, integer i? Uh, what is the default behavior for integer initialization? Nothing, right? Integers are not initialized, that's why they are kind of dangerous to use, okay? That's why there is no, there is no default constructor. There is no destructor, you are not destroying anything, everything is on the stack. And there is no assignment operator. Well, assignment operator is simply this. Line 10, okay? What did it do? Get the value from stack minus 8 to the second register and put that value back to stack minus 12. It looks like it is B. So it is doing everything in this code without using an assignment operator. So it is taking lots of shortcuts, but if I make this a standard, uh, uh, standard, um, standard library stuff with a, co a complex class, then it has to produce because this string I is a is a dynamic thing. It has to be uh, uh, allocated some stuff 
And when you do the assignment, the, again, allocations has to be done, destruction has to be done, etc. So it produces all of those. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let me move on then if there are no questions. Go to our slides. This assignment is just operator loading, nothing more. The question is, <clears throat> this assignment is just an operator overloading and nothing more. Of course, I mean, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do the assignment in C++ other than the operator overloading, yes? I mean, do we know any other way of giving a meaning to assignment operators other than the assignment operator overload? You, maybe your question is this, are we still calling this are we still calling this operator overloading? Yes. The compiler is doing it for us, okay? Automatically uh, uh, overload operator. Yeah. yeah. For this class, it automatically overloads the operator assignment because operator assignment has lots of meaning and it adds a new meaning that the new meaning is for the assignment of the class A. Do you think that I am okay with the default copy constructor, destructor, and the assignment operator in this case? Do you think I should write my big three or the default meanings are okay? Since string is a dynamic class, it makes it large and small by itself, right? Do you think I should overload? Do you think I should define my copy constructor, destructor, and the uh, uh, and, uh, copy uh, and the assignment operator? Any other ideas? I have a word for no here. Maybe me memory efficiency No, no, no, don't. We don't talk about memory efficiency here. And you are not going to implement it more efficient than the default one. Where is your phone? Just take your phone, okay? Not there, just put it, put it behind your desk. Put it on the, behind your desk, okay? Yeah, arka sıraya koy, arkaya bak, arkadaki arkadaşına ver, o telefonuna bakar. Tamam. Turn off computer, turn off your computer. Okay, there is one answer now here. Why do we uh, overload? I am asking the question, I am the professor, okay? So? No, because we don't need it. Why? Uh, the default is already good enough. So uh, that's always that's that's always the case. Then why do we need to define our copy constructor? Then yes, the answer is no. But why? Yes. No, you are you are scratching your head. Good. I think string class uh, takes care of deep copying. Well, exactly. I mean, what is the, the what what is the meaning of the Default assignment operator it is member wise copy, right? It's so this operator, this one is doing the member wise copy of a.i to b.i. So that member wise copy already overloaded. Okay, that member wise copy is already overloaded by the string class, so it works. Okay, so we don't need it, even though my class uses this uh, uh, dynamic object string. Okay. Well, I mean, tomorrow we have the class and the signals I am getting from this class is not good. Okay, uh, let's go back to the classes, uh, uh, my, my, my, my slides. Remember the namespace, namespace is defined this way. I mean, if you put a bunch of classes together, <coughs> bunch of variables, constants, functions, and you, you give them a new name, collection of name definitions is called a namespace, okay? And to be able to use a class or function or variable or something from that namespace, you need to say that I am going to use as namespace, using namespace something, something, okay? Uh, that's what we had been doing using namespace std, right? We are saying that whatever I am going to use is going to come from 
uh, namespace std. If it is not there, I'm going to define it. Okay, <coughs> I'm going to define it. So if you like to have your own object names C out, or if you like to have your own string class, then you can do so by making your own namespace other than the std and define your string class in that in that your class in that your uh, namespace and use it uh, that way because everything everything has to go to some namespace in C++ okay everything has to go to some namespace in uh, C++ so you you might ask well we have been writing programs we have been writing programs <coughs> for a long time and we have never uh, said where my definitions are going to go, right? We did not say that. How am I going to open the recently opened files? Yeah, here it is. Okay. So, for example, PFRAD, I opened it. Other than the, I am going to use the namespace std, I didn't say anything. So where does this PFNAD go? Does it go to the STD? No. You shouldn't add, although you can, you shouldn't add anything to the class, uh, the namespace STD, because it is not yours. But where, is, where does this PFNAD go? What is my, what is my namespace for, for PFNAD? It is global namespace, okay? If you don't specify your namespace, it goes to the global namespace. But how am I going to use something from the global namespace? Well, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to. You don't need to say I am using something from a global namespace. It is. It is. It is by default uh, uh, is used. Okay. It is uh, by default used automatically. Good. Okay. We told uh, all about this, and we know this using directive. We talk about this. We say that. If I am if I am going to call somebody a function, if I am going to use a class, th that class, if it is not in the global namespace, if I didn't do it, then it's going to be uh, from std. Okay. We talked about that. Okay, global namespace, that's the definition. All code goes in some namespace, you can't help it. Okay, it has to be go there somewhere. It is either a namespace that you are specifying or if you don't specify anything, it has to be a global namespace. So until now, uh, well, this is the eight week of the semester. We have been putting everything in the global namespace until now. And it is always available. You don't have to say using namespace global or anything. In fact, you can't say it. Okay. Can I ask a question yeah. Uh, when we use two namespaces together in uh, a file and then we call uh, any uh, object, for example, CE. But let's say CE is both namespace one and namespace two. Can we resolve this uh, intersection by uh, NS uh, resolution operator? So before it's the question is the question is what if I am using two namespaces? And you don't want to use a structure like this. You, that's what you mean, right? I mean, if I put them, if I put these using directives into a different scopes or blocks, then it's fine. This my function will come from NS1. This my function will come from NS2, right? So uh, you are not asking this. No. So you are asking, you are saying that you have such a, you have such a thing using name space ns1 and using namespace ns2. If you write it this way during the midterm, okay, I'm not going to read your handwritings, okay? It should be readable. You are saying that how come you are writing in an unreadable way? Well, I am reading it, right? So I'm going to call function f1 from nf1. And I know that both of them will have, both of them has uh, the function one. Then in that case, you are going to, like you suspected, okay, F1, call this F1 or NS2, F2. 
But if you just, or not F2, so of course, it's F1. If you call it this way, F1, if F1 is in both an S1 and an S2, then this is a compiler. This is a compiler. These are not. Okay? Well, you might say that why don't we, why don't we get rid of all these using statements, using directives, and always give the full qualification names and the last names of all of our identifiers. This is the name, this is the last name, right? Okay? But you can do so, but writing this STD all the time, all over your code, doesn't make it kind of look ugly for a C programmer. Maybe, maybe not for a C++ programmer, but maybe for a C programmer. Okay. Good. Any question? Any other questions? So, Yeet, do you do you miss your phone? No. no. Good. Half an hour. Half an hour. You're get, you're gonna get your phone. Where is my phone? Panic. Okay. Um, creating a namespace is like this. You will say, okay, this is my namespace. Somebody or many people ask about this. What is the difference between the include and using namespace uh, uh, expression uh, uh, statements? Okay. Uh, but includes include means that include is something for the preprocessor. You say that read this file and paste it into my source code. Okay. That's what that's what include <laughs> says. Namespace says that. Okay. When I define a namespace like this, whatever I am defining now is going to go to this namespace definition, okay? In a header file, you may have, in a header file, you may have more than one namespace definitions, okay? You can say, you can say, for example, let me write the header file. My, my header at h, in my header file, this is, uh, okay, you, you might say name space ns1 a class a dot dot dot. Uh, I know I shouldn't, although I shouldn't do this, a global function implemented, okay. And then I ended this namespace definition. Then another namespace. <coughs> Okay, and as two, and I do many definitions in it. So as you see, I can have more than one namespace definitions in a header file or in a source code file. Or I can separate my namespace definition into more than one uh, header file, my header to dot h. Some people read this header as he header, hid, header, header. Hid, header. I don't know how they read it. This is header, okay? Don't don't call it, don't don't read it like something else. Header, header. This is just head. This one, right? Head, okay? Uh, my header too. And in my header too, I can continue putting more stuff in ns1 and add, let's say, class b. As you see, they are very very different. I mean, the, the concepts of headers and the namespaces are different. Of course, we use them in combination, we use them uh, together, okay? Uh, uh, uh, they are not alternatives to each other. They are, they are just different, okay? So I think what makes the, those people confused about is this. At the beginning of the program, at the beginning of the program, I would say, Include string then using namespace std. What is the difference between them? Okay, that's what makes those people maybe yeah. Include this one then using namespace std. Well, I mean this std namespace is defined inside this IO stream. I can add more stuff inside std in pfrad. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, and if if I don't say line seven. I can't use anything from this IO stream because everything in IO stream is it goes to the goes to the almost everything goes to the SCD. So another question is what is the difference between namespace and a library? Okay, 
Library again is a collection of classes, functions, etc. In a library, I can have more than one namespace. Okay, in a library, I can have more than one namespace. And in, an, and in two different libraries, I can have parts of the same uh, parts of the same namespace. Libraries are for the operating systems, okay, uh, either during the linking of your programs or for the case of dynamic libraries or the, uh, uh, or the non-static libraries, okay, DLLs. Uh, for that case, uh, they will be loaded during your runtime. Okay, again, libraries are different from headers and uh, namespaces. Okay, go to this one, multiple names, we talk, okay. What do I mean by multiple names? Of course, this. You may have a function named my function in both namespace one and namespace two. This is way, way different than overloading. This is not overloading, right? Two functions with the same name because they have exactly the same signature, okay? But their namespaces are different. What did I say? Think of namespaces as like, Last names, okay. My function has, uh, in this case, has a last name NS1. This one has a last name NS2. So the compiler would not get confused between them. I saw your phone. Your phone. It is in your hand. Yeah, it is in your hand. I saw it. Where is your phone? Yeah, put it away. Where is your phone? Where is your cell phone? You don't have a cell phone? Really? Okay, thank you. False alarm. Put it away anyway. Yeah. I have a question. Um, does signature uh, return type is not part of signature, right? Return type is not part of the signature, yes. But when I was researching uh, overload, um, when compiler resolves overload issues, yeah. it still looks like the return type. No. No, no. If you define, if you define a function that returns an integer and a double, this is a compiler error. The compiler would not know which one to call. I mean, in C, I can call this function like this, right? Maybe you, you might think that if I call it this way, the compiler would look at the uh, type of A. If it is integer, then it would call this one, right? If it is integer, it would call this one. If it is double, it would call this one. But in C, I can make function calls like this. Which one do you think it's going to call? Right? So there is no way that I can resolve this by looking at the return type. Return type is not in the signature. In C, the signature is the name only, just the name. Name is the signature in C++. Name and the parameters, including the number of parameters, types, and their orders and they are constant, constant <laughs> quantifiers. Okay, good. So uh, you make a new space like this. Uh, I, I can make a new namespace, creating a namespace, and I can, I can, I can do this. Okay, in my function dictates in my header, I say that in space one, I am going to have a function in creating this is in header. In the implementation part, I say that, remember I said that in space one there is a function greeting, okay? I am going to implement it in here. So I am kind of uh, completing my namespace uh, uh, definition in different files. I can do that. Okay, sometimes we don't want to do this. Sometimes we don't want to do this because when you say using namespace NS1, NS1, NS1 might have hundreds or thousands of name definitions, classes, functions, and etc. I don't want to carry all that crap to my namespace, so I like to just say something like, I am going to use, using a declaration, okay, I am going to use this function named fun1 from NS1, and I'm going to use function named fun2 from NS2. From now on, when you make a function call function1, it will come from NS1, and fun2 will come NS2. 
NS1 and NS2 might have both fun one and fun two, both of them. But I am, I am by by doing this, uh, by doing this using declaration, I can do this uh, separation if I like. Okay, this is called declaration. Uh, uh, before this uh, declaration, okay, uh, I was using the using directive. So using name space std is using declaration using directive and this one this one is using using uh, std dot dot c out is using declaration well then, i mean how do you call it is not that important but sometimes we need to be careful about the names okay Okay, so using definitions and declarations, and using declaration is this one, using STDC out, and this one is, well, I already wrote it written in last year or maybe last lecture. Okay, we talked about those, and we know how to, we know how to do a namespace. Let's see an example from the book. Let's see an example from the book. Let me close this down, and we are going to we are going to use this example again. So chapter number, chapter number. Okay, get rid of this one. Chapter number eleven, maybe is it eleven? Maybe 12, try to open it. Well, how come I am not? Okay. Go to. Chapter now. Uh, uh, the the namespace are chapter number eleven, right? Okay, so time demo CPP, time H, and this one, all of them. Let's open them. Wow, th this is not. This is. What is my chapter number? Is it eleven? Right, eleven, right? So this is time demo. We already, where is my namespace? Okay, no, okay. Oh, that, that, this is the first part of that chapter. Okay, let me open the second part of it. This one. Okay. All these three of them. One, two, three, let me close them so that they wouldn't confuse us or confuse me. Close and close. We already did the time demo thing, okay? So, uh, see, this guy says that for the digital time, remember our digital time class? Digital time class. This guy says that, okay, I have a class digital time, but this class will go to namespace d time savage so usually this is how we name our namespaces we put our name in there or we put our institution's name in there so that it wouldn't be confused with somebody else's namespace okay this guy named savage is the name of the author of the book right d time savage is the name of the namespace class digital time class digital time is the class that will go to the time savage into and this is our regular constructors get errors get our okay cons cons advance advance and these are our boolean uh, uh, operator overloads and remember the static stuff these are our helper functions uh, just to show them that these need these don't need any uh, class variables or they don't need any our data members i made them static they are our helpers. I don't like them that they are here, but 
I don't I don't have anywhere to put them. I I mean maybe I can make global functions in my namespace, but we don't like global functions as you know in C++. So that's it. So this 55 is the end of the namespace definition. Okay, let's go to the implementation. Again, in the implementation, I included everything. By the way, I am using, okay, using declarations here. Not directly, but the declarations. I didn't say using namespace uh, std. I am using these, right? And I included d time h. Remember, in the in d time h, I am defining this d time savage. Uh, and this one will go to, if I close this, okay, the whole, whole, whole file is gone, right? Because inside this file, I have uh, the namespace definition for d time savage. And this one, this one is the constructor. Why don't I use this one? Yeah, this is good. This one is for the other constructors, getters, and um, these are the setters with the uh, validity checks, etc. Operator overloads, everything, including those static functions. Where is my uh, readout? Remember this one? This is a static function. It will go to all this D time savage namespace. So the interesting thing is in the application. In the application, I say that I am going to use the namespace std. I am going to use the namespace D time savage. I am I am using both of them at the same time. When the compiler compiles this one, it says that uh, okay, somebody is trying to define a declare an object. Okay, clock. Okay. What is the what is the class of this object? Digital time is digital time part of the is digital time part of the global namespace? No. Is it part of the STD? No. Is it part of the D time savage? Yeah. Okay. It funds it. So it knows that this clock will come from D time savage because at the beginning I said that if you are going to look for something, look in STD and look in D time savage, and by default it looks in. Uh, the, it looks in the uh, global namespace, okay? So I got it, I mean, you are not going to see anything new in this slide. Regular, whatever we've seen uh, in last lecture, uh, at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this chapter, that, that will be it. So it's like using something from STD, I am using something from this one. If you don't want to use, if you don't want to use this line, then then you could say std uh, no d uh, time savage. Okay, <coughs> that's it. Ah uh, yes, that will be it, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Good. Well, if there are no questions, that's then I'm going to go back to my slides and we will continue. Okay, there is nothing complicated about this. But without telling all of these details to you, I mean, this is chapter 11, right? And we have seen this using a directive at the beginning of the semester. In fact, it was the first line of code that I told you that I mean, ignore this for a few weeks and we are going to look at the details, yeah. Now we are looking at the details. Okay, let me go back to the slides and we talk about those. Naming namespaces, choose unique names, your last name or your institution name and etc. I was going to test this, right? Is this, is this, is this thing work? Let me do this first. I am, my, should I use a speaker for this classroom because we have the speakers? How am I gonna use this? Do it like this. Oh, oh. Maybe I should do this. Does it work? Does this work? 
How am I gonna use it? I will figure this out. What? You figure this out during the during the break, okay? Okay. So our naming namespaces. Um, my, okay. Naming namespaces again, it should be unique. Uh, I mean, you shouldn't you shouldn't name you shouldn't name your namespaces like namespace one or namespace two because everybody would do it the uh, same way. Okay. Yes. Question. Who are you? I am Recep. Recep, really? Okay, you are you are taking this class, right? Because this is the first time I'm seeing you. Okay. You have you you you have seen me right before. Yes. You saw me, yeah. Okay. Why we need namespaces? What? Why we need namespaces? Only for multiple words, multiple person words. Why do we need namespaces? Because they are very they are very nice tools to organize your classes and the functions. Because I mean, we don't. We cannot pick very good names for our classes and for our functions, and we end up using the same function names all over again and again, right? But if, if I like to write my own string class, what am I going to call it? My string? And if somebody else tries to write his own string class, it's going to be my string again. So you understand it, right? So there should be a one way of differentiating my standard string class and my string class, right? So maybe I should put my string as a research team in Gabsy Technical University. Maybe my should my namespace should be uh, Gabsy Technical University Computer Science and Engineering namespace, and this is my string class. So both of the strings are alive at the same time. The nice thing is that. I can use the std string inside my string class, right? So that's that's basically it. So it's a nice way of organizing stuff. You say that in C we don't have namespaces, that's true. That means what? I can live without the namespaces. But again, you can live with, uh, it is okay to live without using C++, right? I didn't tell you anything that you cannot do in C, right? In fact, Whatever you do, everything is, everything can be done using the assembly language. And the assembly language is invented in, in 1960s. Okay? So what are we doing here? What are we doing here as human beings? We are trying to make our programming and software engineering life a little bit easier. That's what we are trying to do. Okay? Of course, you might think that by asking those kind of questions, I am making your life a little bit more difficult, but... That's the rule of the game. Okay, good. Put the glasses on and continue. And we already did that. Okay, in my header, I defined everything. Okay. See, the, it looks like a class definition, but of course it's not class definition. And of class definition, I have this one. There is nothing in there, right? And when it comes to the implementation, I implemented everything in it using directives, okay, using declarations. And um, yeah, okay, that, that will be it. So one final concept about uh, namespaces is there's unnamed namespaces, okay? Well, the name unnamed namespace is kind of confusing and people would get confused about the difference between unnamed namespace and the global namespace. Uh, does anybody know anything about the static functions, static global functions? Somebody was asking me about this. Somebody who claimed he knows C++ at the beginning of the semester, I think it was one of the graduate students. I think he's not here. So does anybody know about the static functions in C? In C, there are static functions, okay? If I have a C file, if I have a C file, let's say, my prog.c, and if I have a function in it, let's say, void f, 
dot, dot, dot. If I put this static keyword in front of this function f, that function f can be used only within this file, only in this file. It's not like a global function. It's a global function, but it is only usable inside this file, okay? If I <coughs> make this myproc.ca a part of a library, my customers cannot see this function f because this function f is only specific for this file. So it's kind of a nice way of restricting access to your private functions. So it looks like you can have your private functions in <coughs> C. Nobody can use them. If they try to use it, compiler will say that, no, you can't use it because those are local to those functions, <coughs> local to those <coughs> files. That's why maybe you understand it. <coughs> Remember when we declared static function members in C++, we put the function keyword in front of the function definition inside the class definition, but not in front of the function implementation. Remember that? You say yes. What do you remember? You don't remember? In C++, when I say class A and inside class A, if I have a static function f, I put this keyword in there, but when I implement this function, let's say this is void, okay, uh, I will say void a, f, and implement it, right? I don't put static in front of this one. If I put the static in front of that one, it would become this way, okay? It would, the, the meaning of the static at the global level means this. That function belongs to this file only, this file scope, okay? Why, uh, why <coughs> did I start talking about this static thing all, uh, uh, all of a sudden, okay? Uh, it is because it is related to unnamed namespaces. Okay, let's remember the compilation unit first. Remember what the compilation unit is? Compilation unit is, okay, if I have D time H, D time CPP, and time demo CPP. To compile this whole system, how many times do I, am I going to call my compiler? How many times the compile is going to be called? Run? Two times, right? One is for compiling D time CPP. It will include the time H in it. And the second one is time demo CPP to compile it. I will have two .o files. Later, I will link them. Okay? The third time, I am using a linker, not the compiler. Okay? So, so uh, the thing is this. What I am compiling in the first case D time CPP includes this D time H. Second time I am compiling this time demo CPP, it includes D time H2. Every time I am compiling one large file, right? Remember, uh, uh, remember the file that I showed you? Rest.h. Can I show you again? Rest.h. Is it in this? It is not here. No. Is it, it is not here. Maybe it is in the first one of them here. Where do you, do you guys remember where that rest.cpp is? Was it in the first part of it? Yeah, here it is, okay. Remember this one? Let me load it. It was a very large file, but I think my editor is good enough to Load it and remember this one is length is what? Yeah, 23,000 lines. Remember how I formed it? I compiled time demo CPP. Okay, time demo in it included, included, uh, uh, I think iostream.h, then I included time digital time.h, right? 
So I pasted all of that source code inside this one, and I will end up, I ended up with this file of size 23,000 lines of code, okay? Only, only just 100 lines of code is mine. The rest of them belongs to all those include statements. This is my compilation unit. <coughs> when I compiled this main function, okay? My compilation unit is this. Okay, let's go back. Compilation unit, okay? A file along with all files included in the file. <coughs> well, maybe this is not interesting, but it becomes interesting if you think about this D time H. D time H becomes part of two different compilation units. Okay, I found another guy, okay? Put that phone away. Your phone, yeah. What, what is in your hand then? You are looking at for. I don't understand. Okay, there, there is definitely generation difference between you guys and me. And you are looking at your hand. Okay. I think this is a trap, right? You are doing it on purpose. <laughs> just, just, my phone is here, and just it's really. You know, I will not fall for that one yet. Really, I'm curious. What were you doing? <laughs> What were you doing? <laughs> he was not sleeping. He was not looking at his phone. Just. <laughs> I think I was the same way. Yeah. By the way, I am talking to to you guys a lot because that was my favorite st spot at when I was a student. I mean, you stay from the instructor as as as far away as you as, as possible. That's the safest place. Uh, yeah, compilation unit uh, is, is, is a file along with all the files included in a file. That means that D time H becomes the part of the compilation unit, same compilation unit more than once. That's why, that's why we put cards around D time H, right? Because it becomes, right? It becomes part of the same compilation unit once and twice. And sometimes we try to make this D time H more than once in the same part of the, more than once the, we try to make part of my program more than once uh, in the same compilation unit. That's why we put guards around the, the, the time H, okay? So the second thing is rule, okay? I define this. Every compilation unit has an unnamed namespace. Unnamed namespace really, it doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a name, but it's still a namespace. Well, you might say that, well, isn't that a global namespace? No, it is a little bit different. Why? Because these are the rules, okay? Unnamed namespace, uh, they, they are used to keep things local, okay? And the scope of unnamed namespace is just the compilation unit and that's it. Scope of the global namespace is, okay? Scope of the global namespace is, um, uh, the, uh, uh, is not local, it is everywhere, but unnamed namespaces, the scope is limited to the compilation unit. Okay, a little bit confusing stuff here. Uh, what do I mean by this? And what do I mean by this? It will be clear a little bit, and you are going to see that it's a beautiful idea, and it is very useful uh, for the uh, information hiding and encapsulation principle. But it looks like I am out of time. Let's take some break. 10 minutes, okay? Let's be here around 9.42. Not 52, 42. Resmin olarak bu derse girmedim. Bir sonra gidersen. O kağıt yok ki bende. Hocam sana devam edin. Klas falan dediğimiz de şeyde derste karıştık artık. Yarınki klas falan dediğimiz Allah karıştık. Şey ne diyecek ki? Hocam mesela ben klas operatör yaptığım zaman constant objeye mi döndüm? Daha mantıklı yoksa direkt objeye mi döndüm?
Yani şey gibi düşünüyorum ben. Ne yaptığın zaman? Mesela plus operatör yaptım. Atıyorum bir tane. Ne bileyim. Integer class yazdım. Klasik gönder hemen. Yükseltme daha mantıklı. Ama ben hiçbir şey yapamıyorum ya. Yani. Onu döndürdüm. Bir daha plus yapamıyorum ya. Yani. Niye yapamıyorsun? Eğer yani plus operatörün constant obje kabul ediyorsan. Kabul et. Zaten constant kabul etmiyorum. Ha, Biraz doğru. bir şey değiştirmez ki. Ya ama hay onu sağına plus yapıyorum ya. Bu ne ya? Ha birisi şeyini unutmuş burada. Adam görünüyor. Allah bunu anlamaya çalışacak bu oyun yüzünden çalışıyor. Ne olabilir? Fakir bir hocanın adamı. Şu ne hocam? <gülüyor> tamam şimdi çalışıyorum şimdi çalışıyorum o gitmiş şu an çalışıyor şimdi ne zaman ne şimdi tamam bağlamaya mı çalışıyor şuradan bir şeyler mi yapmam lazım bir de şurada bir şey var bir de o mikrofondur değil o da açılır ben <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Dur bakayım. Aynı alıyor kullanıyor. Orada hep 3 var. 3 artı 5 de. 3'ü değiştiremezsin ki 3'ü kullanıyorsun. 5'i değiştir 5. Toplar siz değerler. 8'i değeri var. 8'i değeri mi? 2'e 5'e dokunmuyor. Yok o neden öyle oluyor biliyor musun? Sen dedin ki ben çazarsan o yüzden ben şey Hayır ama sen sen şöyle yazarsan normalden şey değil ya Abicim tuvasının içinde Operatörü almak daha iyi ya Benim ben tuvası Kendi yazmadan şey için yazdım Obje için yazdım Tamam mı? Evet ki kansan Ve obje döndürüyor Operatörü yazdım Tuvası sistemini yaptım Avutel benim dediğim olmayacak Çünkü kansanlık olduğu için bu tane tuvası almıyor Ama frenk tanım varsa Solda bir kansanlık olacak Sağda bir kansanlık olacak O zaman olacak o yüzden sen tepiyoruz abi. Abi siz mi yok mu? Onun içine sürüyorum. Peki şey yapalım. O kadar para verdim ben buna ya. Ama bir pointer oldu. Orada içine sürüyor. Ve sonra bir taş koyuyor. İçeride bir sürü taş koyuyor. İçeride bir sürü taş koyuyor. Hazır. Hazır. Hazır. Hazır. İçeride pointer varsa şimdi tuvasını distraktör yazacağım ya. E bu distraktör yani diyelim ki string de var içeride. Onu da distraktör etmem gerekiyor mu distraktör? Yani onların distraktör otomatik çağırıyor. Yani ben yazsam bile mi distraktör? Tabii. Çünkü distraktör, distraktör e, sen işin bittikten sonra arka kalan her şeyin distraktörü otomatik çağırıyor. Tamam. Deni onu bugün yazdığım vardı ya, onun içerisine pointer koy, kendi distraktörünü overload et, tamam mı? 
Kendi distraktörün için üretilmiş koda bak. Alt tarafta hmm. swing'in distraktörünün çağırdığını göreceksin. Tamam. <gülüyor> Ne 
spaces um, whatever you put in an unnamed name space is only local to that name space okay um, uh, sorry local to that compilation unit what does that mean first let's let's forget about the meaning of the unnamed name space let's try to see how we use it and let's look at the uh, meaning of it okay I am going to I am going to show you the final part of this chapter, uh, chapter 11, this part, I guess, and this one, yeah. Okay, let me load them one by one. Yeah, okay, good. So let's close these so that they don't confuse us. Close. Close and close. Okay. So D time H, D time Savage, again, namespace. Uh, my class and my class functions, they are all in there. My private and surprise, remember in the private section I had a, a number of static functions. I took them out. Okay. I took them out. They are not part of my class anymore. So that's a relief. Uh, I mean, this problem has been bugging me uh, for the last five uh, weeks, maybe. Okay, so I, I took those functions out of my my uh, header file, and then the time see people let's look at those. Okay, okay, let's look at the, let's ignore this one first. Okay. Ignore this one, okay. My namespace definition is namespace D times I, which is here, 78. And I, I, I did everything inside that D times savage. It is from 78 to 153. It is regular function definitions like the insertion operator, extraction operator, assignment, equality operator, constructor, and etc. That's not. That's no different. That's the exact same. The interesting part is here. Okay. So line to line twelve is a line twelve is a, a namespace definition, but it's a unnamed namespace. Okay. Uh, unnamed namespace is something that you define as a namespace. It doesn't have a name. It's kind of weird, so if I am, I mean, I know how, I'm, how I am going to use this one, right? I am going to say, using namespace D times savage, right? That's how I'm going to use it. But how am I going to, how am I going to use this one? <coughs> Unnamed name, it doesn't have a name, okay? Well, the answer is you are not going to use it because you are not going to use 
any unnamed namespace functions or classes in any other place. This unnamed namespace functions, they only belong to the compilation unit, current compilation unit, okay, current compilation unit. They cannot be used anywhere else. So this is kind of, remember what we said about you define your uh, uh, class by defining your data and defining your functions to work on data. This is kind of the same, same principle. You say that, okay, these functions are local to this namespace only, okay, or this compilation unit, sorry, this compilation unit only, and other, other, than, the, the, other than this compilation unit, nobody else can see it. So they are kind of global, but many, many, many customers will not see them unless they are in the same compilation unit but I am not going to give this the time CPP to anybody else. That means that my customers cannot see them. So they are kind of private to me, but they are not part of the class. That's good because they shouldn't be part of the class. They are, they are private to me, this, uh, this, this D time CPP, like the static function of a, remember what I said about the C static functions? Like a C static function, it is only local to this file or it is only local to that compilation unit, okay? Uh, uh, I satisfy that uh, requirement of keeping my functions local. They are not global. Uh, not everybody can use them, only I can use them. But they are not my private functions either, which is good because they are not really my private functions. So unnamed namespace are like that. And uh, since they are, they are local to this compilation unit only, when I go to time demo CPP, this digit to end or read minute or read hour, okay, they cannot be accessed from this time demo CPP, okay? They cannot be accessed from there. And uh, as a nice thing from the book, the book says that, okay, here is read hour, remember? I had another read hour here. Where is my read hour? Read hour, read minute. Read hour, line 41. Line 41 in my unnamed name space of D time CPP, there is a read hour function. But in time demo CPP, I have another read hour function. They will not be confused with each other. Even though they had the exact same signature, they are in two different namespaces. Okay? The other one is in the unnamed name space of D time CPP. The other one is in the namespace of what? Line seven. It is in the namespace of global namespace, exactly. Exactly, this is not global namespace. This is unnamed namespace of D time CPP compilation unit. This is in the global namespace uh, of the whole uh, software system. Can I ask the question? Yes. Which one? Which one you should prefer to use uh, static private memory functions? Of course, this one. Because as I said before, I did not like at all a function becoming part of my class, but that function has nothing to do with my class, right? That, that function reads an hour from the keyboard, right? It is not part of my class. It is, it is function is different. So make it part of, make it part of, it's like a helper function, right? Make it part of your unnamed namespace of your <coughs> compilation unit and um, a compilation unit and uh, keep it private to your compilation unit. So it's kind of local to you. Only you can call it in your compilation unit, but it is not part of your uh, class either. Okay, yes. Uh, what if we put uh, our set of functions in, uh, in unnamed spaces? Does it make it better for like, this privilege? Well, if you, I mean, uh, static uh, member functions, you mean, right? No, static. Not, not just the uh, casual function, I mean. Static function, like the C static function? No, normal, normal function. Just function. Member, well, uh, for, that you need a, you, for that you need a class, right? Yes, I have a class. And but your class has to be part of the time savage. You cannot put your a member function and unnamed namespace if that class is part of the time savage, right? 
So you cannot separate your class into two different namespaces. It has to be in the same namespace. Yes? Can I write using namespace inside a namespace? To use a name namespace? No. You are you are asking some a question that is not related to unnamed namespaces. So what is the question? Um, can I write using namespace std functions in another namespace? In another namespace? Sure, yeah. That's what we have been doing, right? I mean, by writing, by let, let's go to this one. Okay. By writing this using stdio stream here, or anywhere in my a uh, file is not different as long as you you write that using namespace directive or declaration before you use that identifier <coughs> okay my favorite position in the class that tell that guy not to use what are you using yeah uh, yeah your cell phone put it away put it away what? Uh, uh, is our attendance on? Okay, maybe I shouldn't be this careful about this cell phone thing. Okay, don't forget the attendance. Thank you. <laughs> He's reminded us. Okay. <coughs> Good. So we looked at it and let's go back. Unnamed namespace, we define it. By the way, if you, this is important, maybe you shouldn't do this. Let's say if you try to define unnamed namespace, just you say namespace and you define something. So this is the unnamed namespace of D time H, right? But if I include this in D time CPP, which I should, also, I am including this in time demo CPP, which I should do. So, this unnamed namespace becomes part of the unnamed namespace of this compilation unit and this compilation unit. You, you see it? Maybe I shouldn't do this, or when I am doing this, I should be careful about that, right? Remember, unnamed namespaces are local to the, what? Not files, compilation units. I have two compilation units in here, A and B, right? One is for this one, the other one is for one. But compilation unit for this one, D time CPP, includes D time H. And so this unnamed namespace becomes part of the unnamed namespace of this compilation unit. Okay? And also it becomes unnamed namespace of the this compilation unit. So be careful about uh, uh, that. So. Let's compare global namespaces with the unnamed namespaces. They are not the same. Global namespace, no namespace grouping at all, global scope. It's like what we do in C. Unnamed namespaces, it is, it is, it is, it is very specific. It has namespace grouping, it has just no name. It's local scope. Since it doesn't have any name, you cannot say that I am going to use unnamed namespace, right? So it has to be local to the compilation unit. Good. Uh, like we did before with the classes and everything, nested namespaces are possible. Okay, don't ask me why we will you with this one, but I mean, if you like to do more organization within your organization, then you can use namespace inside another namespace that's called uh, nested namespaces, like the nested classes, right? Sometimes uh, if, you, if, you, if you see them being used, then don't get confused. Okay, good. So when I say stdc out, okay, std is not a class, okay? It looks like std is a class, c out is a, a static data member of it, no. std is a namespace, okay? c out is an object, global object, or the object specific to std defined in this uh, namespace. What did I say? We don't like global objects, global variables in C++. And that's why I kind of say that I don't like C out, but C out is not exactly a global thing. It's a, it's a part of a namespace STD, okay?
part of a namespace std. But since it is a public thing, okay, since a public thing, everybody who has access to access std can use the sealed. Okay, that's the nested, that's the, that's the nested namespaces. Um, okay, hiding helping functions. Okay, uh, remember the, those those functions in in in our in our classes. We made them private at the beginning. I didn't like it. We made them static uh, privates. It was a little bit better. Why? Because by making them static, I am saying that these <coughs> functions will not work on my data. Uh, so that's that's that's nice but still, still didn't like it. Better thing is, make them part of your, part of your unnamed namespace for that compilation unit. And that way you are going to make them private to your uh, compilation unit. Nobody else other than you as a software developer can use them. They are kind of private in that case and they are not part of your classes. Okay? Please. Placing classes, class implementations on name namespace. If a function needs no calling object, makes clean record, no qualifiers, etc. Okay, that I guess that will be that will be it. Uh, that's the that's the whole chapter. Are there any questions? Comp separate compilation and namespaces. Yes. Using namespace std in another space, uh, another namespace, does it carry on to the whole file or only the that namespace code? Using namespace std doesn't bring anything, okay? Unless you start using something from that namespace. So when you say using namespace std, okay? This will not get anything from this namespace. When you look at the produce code, okay, you will not see any classes, any objects from namespace std. But when you start using things like C out something, then it will bring the C out. Okay, so it potentially introduces identifiers from this std. Um, no, I, I was asking whether that using namespace std carry on that's what I'm saying. This doesn't carry anything, okay? Uh, this will say that from this on, when you try to find an identifier for, uh, other than the other than the name namespace and the global namespace, you are going to look into this STD, okay? That's kind of a. That's why this is directive. You are telling the compiler that. I am telling you some path to look for the identifier names. This will not bring anything to your code. This will bring it. Can I ask a question backwards? Uh, when we use unnamed namespaces, uh, the functions inside them, uh, we, we connect them to header to CPT file, right? In order to define uh, that function. When we do that, uh, how can we just uh, call, just defining them is enough for accessing them? Or well, I mean, the, the question is, I mean, when you define, when you define the, a function or class in an unnamed namespace, how am I going to use them? Well, let's look at the example. How we can define them in another CPP file, because we define them in function. Well, you don't, you don't, I mean, this namespace, okay, this name, whatever you, this, this digit to end is specific to this compilation unit of uh, time, D time CPP, okay? You cannot use this digit to end in another CPP file because that other CPP file ha will have its own unnamed namespace. Unless you include one CPP file from another one using the include statement, which is a bad, bad thing. It's not meaningful to use unnamed namespaces in .bash files, right? Well, you shouldn't do that, yes. If you do that, that unnamed namespace definition becomes part of more than one uh, compilation unit, and that would be confusing. <coughs> because whoever includes it can see your functions now. Okay. 
Okay. Good. Uh, from from this on, I think our our midterm will cover uh, everything that I told you uh, from the beginning of the semester to this point. After this point, uh, uh, uh, I, it will not be covered in the midterm. Uh, okay. Anything from chapter one to chapter zero to end of chapter eleven will be covered in your book. Anything I covered or did not cover, okay, you are responsible. Uh, but I am now going to look at a new topic. And where is my... Okay. Let me, let me, let me, let me get to my slides and go to our new chapter, which is chapter... Am I going to look at the recursion? Maybe I should talk about the recursion right now, yeah. Let's look at the recursion, yes. Okay, because I have 20 minutes or something like that. Since I talked about the stacks and uh, uh, lots of stuff, um, for that, should I, should I, yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me go to, where is, okay, classes. My slides, slides, and chapter 11, after chapter 11, I have chapter 12 is uh, streams, Ilhan talked about them. Let's go to the recursion. You already know what recursion is. I am not trying to, I am not going to try to teach you what recursion is right now, but Maybe we should look at the recursion in a more careful way. Okay. I have this function. Okay. Let's look at this function. What does it do? It takes an integer k. Are you talking in Turkish? No. Okay. Uh, what is the midterm hour? When during the during the class time. Midterm will be tomorrow, 15, 11, 20, 22 at 8.30. Okay. If you are late more than maybe 30 minutes, I will not, uh, you, you cannot be in the midterm. You will not be accepted in the class or okay exam. And I will not anybody out for the first 40 minutes of the exam. Okay. Two hours. Eight or yeah, two hours. It will be in this in this uh, classroom. Also, two more classrooms. I guess there will be 150 people. Yeah, the three classrooms should be enough. Yeah. How many questions we ask? I don't know. I mean, it is going to be. Uh, well, I mean, two hours will be enough to, so doesn't matter. I mean, usually there is a one big question, the, the whole class implementation and writing the driver class and driver uh, uh, code and everything. There would be a definition kind of thing, what is encapsulation, why we use it kind of thing. There would be a function, uh, uh, maybe a global function, right? And uh, usually there would be a debugging or tracing, tracing a uh, question, okay? What would be the output of such code? Usually I ask that one. I think there is somebody, uh, one of our graduates, uh, he, he, he, after each class, he r wrote down all the um, questions and he has a GitHub page. He, he is sharing all of that stuff. So, Look for the previous year's questions. They will be very useful because, I mean, whatever I'm asking, I ask them uh, by modifying the previous year's questions. Okay. Any other questions about the midterm exam? Okay. Uh, study hard. But today, the, I, I, I hope that you are shy. You are not giving me any uh, answers. Uh, for my question, only one or two people are giving me answers. But I mean, the signals that I am getting from the classroom is not, is not good now. 
I mean, some of the key things, you are not giving me any good answers. This is not, this is not just to, okay, um, demoralize you or anything like that. But this is what I am saying. Okay. So, if there are no questions, let's start looking at this one. Look at this code. Integer f, it takes a integer k. It looks like I had written this in a hurry or something like that. I don't know. This is an integer. It doesn't matter what I, I'm, I end up writing the same thing. Okay, integer k. If integer k is less than one, it returns one. Otherwise, it calls, what does this do? While you are reading it, let me try to make it look better. Return one. This is return T2. What does this do? It's factorial, right? It is factorial. If K is less than or equal to one, return one. Otherwise, call FK minus one. And whatever it returns, multiply it with uh, K and put it in T2 and return T2. Just a factorial function. Now I'm going to go over the procedures of compiler, what it does uh, to compile this code. And during the runtime, what happens? And we are going to see, we are going to see uh, what happens with our stack. Because recursion is all about stack, okay? Recursion is all about our stack and our local variables, okay? And this one, it says that in my main function, uh, I have an integer m, its value is three, and I am going to call this function f with m, and I will put this result into n, and at the end, I will, I will, I will be done. Okay, so let's say, well, this is not SMD routine, but let's say, I mean, uh, the, although it's not SMD, let's, let's think that like the, these are my SMD lines, okay? So I have 12 lines of SMD code, you might think, okay? I'm just simplifying it, oversimplifying it, okay? When my program starts running, the operating system say that, okay, run. You are going to start running at line number eight. So my program counter, remember, my program counter from your 101 course, there is a program counter register. It tells the CPU at what location it is executing. Line number eight, it is main, okay? When I come to line number nine, okay, say that I am going to make a new variable. It's an integer, okay? And its initial value will be three. Since it's a local variable, it will be put, uh, it will be put on the stack, and that's what I am going to do now. Okay. Let me try to do this. This is my stack. Okay. In my stack. In my stack. Let me get this. When my program starts running, main program, okay, it immediately, it immediately says that, okay, uh, I, I should return something when I am done with this main function. So there should be a return address in the operating system's uh, position. I don't know where that is. It will be stored by the operating system, okay? But my return value, I should return something and I don't know what I am going to return for now. Because that return thing, that return thing will be determined at the end of this function call. Okay? What else? Line number nine. Line number nine says that, okay, there is a new integer. Its name is m, and its value is three. Of course, just three is stored in there. Uh, my assembly routine doesn't know. My code doesn't know. Uh, the name uh, N, okay, M. <coughs> then it says that there is a, there is a new variable named N. Its value is going to be, 
Its value is going to be calculated by calling this function f. Okay? By calling this function f. By the way, my PC became now 9 program counter. I executed this. My program counter is now 10. Line 10 is being executed. And my stack pointer, remember that FP thing that I showed you, is now showing that this position N. Okay, previously it was at this position, then this, then this. I don't know the value of N. To be able to calculate the value of N, I need to call this function F. I need to call this function F, okay? Whatever it returns, I am going to put at that location N, okay? But, but, uh, first I need to call that uh, function F, okay? To call a function, you are going to do the same thing. First, the return address, return address. I will return to address number 10. Okay, I put it on my stack. And return value, whatever is returned, I am going to put in, in N, right? I don't know that either. So see, my, my stack pointer, why don't I do this pointer thing? Stack pointer green, right? Green. If I do it this way, I can do it right Yeah. okay. So my stack pointer is pointing to that location now. Okay, return value, I don't know. I don't know yet, I did not calculate it yet. I did not calculate it yet, my return value. But when I return, I will return to address number 10. Okay, let's go to, let's go to the function f. My program counter is going to be now one. Okay, at line one, what am I gonna do? What does line one do? Function call. Well, I did already the function call, that's why at, I am at one line one. J equals three. What, what does, so what, say it again. J equals M. So, it is making a new integer, a local integer, right? Its name is K. And since this is called by value, I am going to copy the value of M to the value of K. It's going to be three, and now my stack is pointing to this location, okay? At, this, at the top of my stack, I will have this value, okay? K is now three. So I am done. I will increment this program counter now it is two. At line two, it says that, look at the value of k. If it is less than or equal to one, you are going to return one, put one in here, and return. Return where? Return to address number 10. But k is not less than or equal to one. So what am I gonna do? I will skip, okay, I will skip line three, and I am now at line four. Line four, okay? Line four. Line four, what does it do? It says a new variable. Okay, so if it's a new variable, then my stack is pointing to here. Its name is T1. Okay. And its value is, well, I am calling another function F. Okay. When you call this function F, it will calculate something, it will return it, and I am going to put it in T1, okay? So what am I gonna do? Let's make a function call. Function call is, okay, function call is uh, F, okay? So let's do this again, remember what I do? For that one, return address is going to be what? Tell me the return address. Four. Return address is what? Four, yeah. Return address is four, return value is going to be again, I don't know, okay? So I call this function, and function is at line one, and by the way, I am going to be pointing that at the top of the stack like that, okay? So line one, it is K, 
right? What is the value of k now? It is, so it is very confusing now. I am going to send this value k minus one. Here at this place, k is three, k minus one is two. I am sending two to this function and it will be two. So it looks like I have two k's in my memory. That's, that's really, but I am seeing this one now. It is this other k, which is the previous uh, version of my k. It is not dead, it is alive, but is out of my reach, okay? It is buried deep down in my stack. Okay, k is two. This is my stack, and my, my program counter is now one. I executed that line, executed line number two. If k is less than or equal to return one, but, but it is not, so uh, I am going to skip it and I am going to go to line number four. Line number four says that, what does it say? It says that, okay, put one more variable in your stack. Its name is T1. And its value is going to be F K minus one, another function call. See, a recursive function, whenever it calls itself, it doesn't know that it is calling itself, right? It is just making a function call. It doesn't know that it is calling itself, okay? It just says that I am making a function call. So let's do that again. Uh, what is that function? It is, again, function f, its address is one. My program counter is going to be one. And again, my return address is going to be what? My return address is going to be, say it again, four again. My return value, I don't know what I'm going to return. Okay, now my stack is like that. Okay, my stack is pointing in that position. I am at line one. Okay, line one says that you have a new variable k. k will be assigned to this one minus one is going to be one, right? Okay, let's continue. Execute this one, it is going to be two now. If k is less than or equal to one, okay, what is k? One, then return one. Finally, we hit uh, line number three. So the value that I'm going to return is what? One. Return value is one. I am returning my function to address four, right? I am going to return to address four. I am going to return one, right? So this is called, this is called this part of the stack, this part of the stack is called stack activation record. Stack, stack activation record. The stack activation records are done for each function calls. And why do we name them? We name them because when the function is done, I am returning, I am returning this value. I know where to return, I know, I know what to return. So I am going to just copy this value here. It's going to be one. And I am going to take this, this one, this one, and this one away because they are not, I don't need it anymore. So my, my stack pointer is pointing to this position, this position, sorry, this position, this empty place. And I am going to Erase this one, I am going to erase this one, and I am going to erase this one. Okay? So line number four, I return to line number four. My program counter is line number four. Four is here. I return what? I return to FK minus one. Now I am going to I am going to put it in there. T1 becomes one, right? T1 is one. So what am I gonna do now? Go to line number five, I increment it by one. Line number five, line number five says that T2, make a, make a new object T2, okay? T2 is my new object on top of the stack. Its value is T1 times K. K is two, T1 is one, 
and its value is now 2, right? Then line number 6, line number 6, line number 6 that return t2. So what am I going to do? Put this 2 in here, return value is 2 now. Okay, I'm going to write it in uh, green. Can you read greens? Maybe not so. Three, two now. Uh, try to make this noise go away, kind of. Can I make this go away? I can, I can make the whole thing go away. Really? Yeah. They, well, it is, it is picking up some noise somewhere. Is it because we play with this stuff? Or maybe it is because of this thing, yeah? There's an aftermarket charger from China. That's what this makes to your computer. Yeah? So th does it hurt my computer? I guess so. Well, it's going to die anyway, so... It's charging. Did it crash? No? Oh, I fixed it. See? If, if something doesn't work, okay, always turn it off and on. It will work. So where am I now? Line number six, okay, I am returning T2. T2 is returned and value returned is two. And I am going to return to line number four, okay? Again, go to line number four and Line number four, uh, return value is two, okay? So take this away, take this away, take this away, take this away, take this away, return address is four. What did I return? I returned two, okay? So T1 will get the value of two now. And my stack pointer is pointing to this location. Again, I will increment this PC by 1, now it is 5, okay, 5 says that T2 is going to be T1 times K, what is T1? 2, K is 3, so it's going to be 6, and I am going to return, I am going to return 6 now, return value is 6, this time I am returning to address number 10, and my PC is going to be 10, okay? 10 says that whatever is returned, put it in N. I am returning, what is return value, 10? I am going to, I am, sorry, I'm returning six. I am going to put the six in here, and this will go away, this will go away, this will go away, and that will be, that will be it. After that, I am going to return Zero, return value is zero. Okay, I am returning to some place that belongs to operating system now, right? Because I don't know where it is. Okay, that's how recursion works. As you see, every time you make a new function call, the function doesn't know that it is calling itself. It says that I, I, will, I will save my return address, I will reserve a position for the return value, and I will jump to the beginning address of that function. When the function is done, I will get my value. That function might call another function, another function, another function, and that will continue that way. That's the whole story of the recursion, okay? That's the whole story of the recursion. The system with what? Recursion. Well, if you, if you try to call the same function over and over again without any end, that means what? You will, you will end up using your whole memory, right? So that will be called infinite recursion, but there is no such thing as infinite recursion. Why? Because there is, we don't have infinite memory. Your memory will fill up and your program will be crashed. And your operating, remember what we did before? Yes. Your program, your, your, maybe your operating system will crash. But that time I was, I was overloaded too much because um, I was recording something and I was doing lots of stuff. By the way, my, my, my computer did not crash. I wasn't patient enough to wait uh, for it to wake up. So, I mean, that's why you should be very careful about recursion. If you are doing 
too many recursive steps you are using uh, but you need to store your return address you need to store your return value your local variables and etc every time you make a recursive call you are eating up your memory okay this is how the recursion works but we don't write our recursive programs by thinking about how the recursion works right i mean the way it works is different than the way we use it okay this is just a detail of how the recursion works but to write the recursive functions we think about only two things what is the base case and how do i write code to reach the base case divide the problem into more than one part and it is simpler than the original one. Divide and conquer, right? Divide and conquer. Okay, I'm sorry I used too much of your time, but you are coming to the class late anyways. So from now on, I am going to leave you late. That's it, okay? I'll see you tomorrow morning.